Welcome to the podcast from Eden Worship Center. Because we believe that it is God's Word that does God's work in God's people, we want you to hear the gospel preached in the gathering of believers. We want you to read it for yourself and to join us as we think together and talk together about the sermon from this past week and what's going on in our world. You can join the conversation by sending in your comments and questions to EdenWC at Hotmail.com. May God cause His Word to come alive in your heart today. All right, well, welcome to the Midweek Podcast. Pastor Matt here. We have a couple newbies in with us here. So guys, you want to just introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, my name's Josiah. I'm Pastor Matt's son-in-law. Which is the only reason we let him in. That's Correct. it. Like that's it. zero other redeeming qualities. <laughs> no, he's got more than that going on. No, nope, that's it. That's it. No, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Avery. I have my um, master's Avery, in theology. Avery, what's your... Avery, I told you not to screw this podcast up, and you're lying immediately to the people Good of start. God. Good start. Like, there are six Christians who listen to this who are seriously disappointed <laughs> right six now. Six listeners. So, like <laughs> Avery, what's your last name? Nickum, son Nick. of Rusty and Amy. The son of Rusty and Amy. All right. That's good. Yep. Yep. So... Uh, what are you guys doing right now that got you involved in this podcast? Anything in particular? School of Ministry. School of Ministry. What's that? Uh, School of Ministry is a college-like course. Uh, it's similar in college course in the fact that it's incredibly demanding. Uh, it's over a two-year period, but it's just a course meant to um, enrich and encourage uh, believers to study God's Word and uh, be encouraged into wanting to have that desire to go into ministry and what that looks like Good. and how that's played out and yeah. how to prepare for it. Good. Avery, what else are you guys working, involved in doing? Young adults. Yeah. So what does uh, that look leader, like? Some of the leaders of that, but we were having a get together and then Matt was like, Hey, be in the podcast. And we were like, eh, right sure. On. sure. sure. <laughs> yep. So both of these guys are uh, involved in school ministry and both of them are involved in leadership team of the young adults ministry here at the church and uh, organizing that thinking through it hopefully hopefully connecting young people sort of upper high school and 20-ish something I don't know exactly where it's it's bad to put a, t a date on the end of young adults because like no you're old yeah you're really old you're really out you're not like in our group age. Yeah, there really isn't like an age. It's more of like trying to once have you're so old that you start complaining about aches and pains, or you're just like boring. Is that when we kick people out, or how do we do it? No, I don't think so because I think the majority of us are already there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so boring. We, we so we wouldn't, we wouldn't be eligible. Full really, of yeah. pain and <clears throat> agony. All right. Well, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the sermon from a couple weeks ago. Uh, this past Sunday, Pastor John spoke talking about a biblical apologetic for the the ministry that they're looking to um, be a part of mm -hmm. life action uh, and then in the evening uh, so that the sunday morning was sort of like a, a scriptural defense of of that approach to ministry the evening he then talked about what it is that they are looking potentially at doing like what's the job that they are lord willing going to be uh, fulfilling there what it means for their family timeline all that sort of stuff so that uh, we've actually dropped as a separate podcast. So there's two midweek podcasts this week. Oh, nice. Last week, zero. Bonus This contact. week, two. Wow. We made a, it's like when you uh, run a red light and then you say, I'll stop twice next time. Oh, it, <laughs> never heard of No, that. that's not how it works. Okay, but anyway, so if you uh, want to catch those, uh, you can find the video and the audio for those both online. Uh, this week, we want to kind of back up and talk about the week before in the sermon, we looked specifically at Genesis 10 and 11, a, a section of scripture that gets known as the table of nations as uh, God, we, we've been introduced to Noah and God has led Noah, preserved Noah and his family through the flood. Noah comes off the boat with his two or his three really, really old sons, <laughs> Shem, Ham and Japheth. And they're all like pushing a hundred years old, haven't mm -hmm. had any kids yet. And they're like, well, I guess it's time. Well, that's when they're in living the in their dad's basement. Yeah. The basement of the ark. <laughs> dad, can we just hang out here for a while? That's what it's like. Uh, you guys are ruining this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like a college conversation here. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so 
what we're given in chapters 10 and 11 is, and -and so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so, just this giant list of genealogies for all three of these sons and how they progress, which I thought, okay, maybe that's a good place for us to start in our conversation because most Christians, when it comes to genealogies, we just kind of check out. Mm -hmm. Like personal Bible reading, you're flipping through the pages, reading God's word, and then you come to two glorious chapters of genealogies Mm -hmm. in Genesis 10 and 11. You're like, I'm pretty sure God's going to send a flood or destroy something here pretty soon. I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead. Get to the good stuff. Yeah. Get to the good stuff. Right. Uh, I think Moeller described how we normally preach through books like Genesis as we just preach the highlights Mm -hmm. and storybook stuff, the storybook stuff, how it, why is that potentially dangerous if we just preach highlights and we skip things like genealogies? Um, I think this, maybe hey, that's the- all the time we got. Join <laughs> us next week. At, I'm sorry, Josiah. I had to do it at least once. That's fine. That's fair. I've, I've waited. We're almost like six minutes in. All okay. right. Sorry that you were saying. Uh, I think it's fair to say that a simpler answer is that it's in there for a reason. You know, the Bible, all of it. Good. All of it is equally breathed by God um, and equally important. Um, so it's in there for a reason. We should probably pay attention to it. But it's also good to know, as we're going to talk about in deeper context, how God is faithful to his people yeah. and in that selecting and choosing a family uh, for himself. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so maybe just thinking a little bit about personal Bible study. Um, I, I appreciate that our church does expositional verse by verse teaching through books. So do I. Uh, it doesn't mean every church has to do that, but I'm glad we do. So our people are going to get a systematic look at the book of Genesis, whether they like it or not. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and it's going to take so long. Like if you take a couple it's, weeks off, we still got you, baby. It's been good uh-huh. though. It's been really good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've it's heard encouraging. Of a good, I've heard of good outcomes. Have this. you heard complaints? Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, about the genealogy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thinking about personal Bible reading, right? Because that's where we can really miss it. Mm-hmm. What do you guys do? Because I, I know for most Christians, they have some point in li- their life where they really struggle to systematically read God's word. Mm-hmm. And... At other times, they do really good, but there's, I mean, Scripture doesn't tell us how we should read it, how we need to be devouring it. It just gives us all these images of, like, hungering, thirsting for righteousness and the words of God and hiding God's Word in our heart. But what what is it that you guys do? And Avery, maybe we'll just kick off with you. What, what do you do as far as personal Bible study and um, letting your heart just sit in God's Word? Yeah, um... Personally, like I, what I like to do is I'm kind of a history buff for the biblical stuff. So I got to know what setting I'm in, what timeline, what's going on in the area that this is being wrote in so I can try to fully grasp and understand what they're writing about. Yeah. Because a lot of times, um, like Moses is extremely poetic and his writing is just beautiful. So if you kind of try to put yourself in his shoes and understand like what's going on then it can make a lot more sense yeah so i right now i use my um john MacArthur uh study bible and then i'll read his intro of the history stuff before actually reading the um the scriptures so i can kind of get my mindset into okay this is what's happening and then after i do that then i dive into scripture and then usually i will just go verse by verse i don't know uh let's say like Genesis 10 or something. I'll just go Genesis 10. And if I see a word that I'm unfamiliar with, I'll just go on Bible hub, which is a great app. And then go to lexicon and then see the Greek or the Hebrew that's yeah, being right used on. and yeah. just see the words. Cause sometimes it can totally change your view on what's actually being said. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's, basically how I do my personal Bible studies. The lexicon on Bible hub is one of my favorite free tools. Uh, if, you're listening to this and you don't know about it, uh, just type in Bible hub and then Genesis 10 and it's going to bring it up. Uh, It'll give you, if you go Genesis 10 verse one, it will give you all the translations one after another. So you can see, okay, this is how the NIV says it. The ESV says it, uh, new American standard, the King James, the, you know, just on and on and on. 
But then if you hit the little lexicon tab, if you're in the Old Testament, it takes you to the Hebrew. If you're in the New Testament, it takes you to the Greek and shows you what the word is, how the word is used elsewhere in scripture, what's the meaning, the definition of the world. And it's free. Yeah, it's That's amazing. the amazing thing about it. You know, you can spend it's a whole awesome. bunch of money on a big Strong's Concordance or you can get it for completely free yeah. online. It, what I tell a people great to use it resource. all the time. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm learning about this now. It's great. <laughs> get it. I, uh, I've definitely. By the way, if you if you forget what so. it's called, go to EdenWorshipCenter.co, our website, mm -hmm. and in links, uh, there's a link to it that's on there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah actually, last week we were um, during our discipleship group. We were going through First uh, Peter three. I think it was, and then we were reading it, and then Pete Kaufman, who's probably going to watch this, was like, okay, what does this mean? And I was like, well, let's check the Greek, and he was like, you did that pretty fast. How did you do that? And I was like, well, you just get Bible Hub, and so it's really handy. Yep. You had a perfect opportunity to be like, I just, I, I know Greek. <laughs> I just know it. I learned it. Yeah. And you Koine. It. <laughs> it's how I rock. <laughs> That's a nice shirt. Koine, it's how I rock. Even t shirts with the midweek podcast. T shirt ideas. That's Seriously. right. That's right. That's Coming what this fast. Is now. I think this is good for the Bible Hub app. Not yeah. The app, the app. Yeah. Official sponsor. <laughs> yeah. The official sponsor. Perhaps. No, that, if anyone's listening, from, no, you're not listening. <laughs> Just say, how about you? What What is like personal Bible study look like for you? Uh, recently, very similar. So um, after reading. Living by the Book, uh, super wonderful, since we're advertising a whole bunch of stuff here now. Uh, Living by the Book, wonderful uh, resource in helping, because like you had just said, like, unless you actively seek it or ask somebody personally, you aren't, you don't know how to read the Bible and yeah. how to read different parts of the Bible, different yep. books, because they're written differently and written by different people. So, and even though it's all breathed by God, like he uses different tools to display his glory and his word. So... Um, yeah, I, I do something very similar um, in Living by the Book. It talks about using all those other resources like Maps, uh, Strong's Concordance, now Bible Hub. Yep, it's which has all of that compacted of into one place. Yeah. So that's For free. Definitely super interesting. Um, I've been looking into the, the uh, Systematic Theology book. Mm -hmm. That's interesting as well. But I think what is more important, like going through it, a lot of study Bibles have it in their introduction as well, but mm -hmm. like trying to break down wherever I'm at, answering like the five W's, questions like that, just getting your mind um, in that place where you were, where you just left off. Like what's going on? Where are we at? Who's writing it? Where are they at when they wrote it? Um, what's going on in the culture society at the time? Um, it's also helpful to know like what kind of uh, writing is this? Is it poetry? Is yeah. it a uh, story? Is it, um, you know, s stuff like that. It's important to give you better context. Um, I try to stay away from uh, just kind of starting from somewhere random. Yeah. You know, I, I found it very helpful in my private time. Like right now, uh, my buddy Seth and I are listening through the word from front to back um, at during during work and some of our extra time to try to stay on track with each other. Yeah. Um, but it's been super helpful to read that or at least listen that way because it's very easy to remember where we were, where are we in the scripture, like what's going on uh, to help give better context with what we're reading or yeah. slash listening to. Yeah. But yes, yeah, pretty similar. If, yeah. if I may. Jump in. The, like Bible Hub and all of that stuff is super helpful. But the most helpful thing is Jody and I, before we read, we usually ask for God's um to grant us understanding yeah. or, and wisdom and knowledge that comes with the reading so he can help our minds kind of like absorb all that yeah. stuff. No, that's super important yeah. because without that, without the Holy Spirit to help us to, to discern the writing and the words and the breath of life that is the word of God, it literally to us is just yeah. words. Yeah, it, it has no meaning and has no purpose for us other than just these are cool stories and interesting, but... Doesn't it becomes like a high school English reading project. Absolutely. Where yeah. you have some beautiful, poetic, you know, classic piece of literature that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got to read this. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're missing out the beauty and the wonder that's mm -hmm. there. Now take that times about a billion because this is the very word of God. Yeah. Yeah. 
given to the saints that we might know him yeah. and it, no how Lord, much more yeah. when God opens our hearts and opens our minds. That's what we pray for our kids every single week. God, open their hearts, open their minds, let their eyes see Jesus. Cause apart from that, you can know all the stories about Jesus and not know Jesus, yeah. mm -hmm. not having saving faith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what's the danger to individual Christians and the church? If we neglect either reading God's word like you ask so many Christians like, Oh, I, I would love to do that. I just don't have time, which is another way of saying I'm lazy or I'm prioritizing other things and I'm an idolater. So <laughs> I'm not saying that that's how we, we broach the conversation. Like, Oh, I, I really haven't done it. Oh, which are you lazy or an idolater? Are you loving other things and worshiping other things? Or are you just lazy and undisciplined and you don't really love Jesus that much? Whether that question is true or not, I think it's important to attribute grace. To yeah, maybe, maybe we shoot in a different direction <laughs> in conversations with people. Yeah. But okay, so that's, that's the starting place. Or if the individual Christian doesn't approach their reading of Scripture or even churches from the uh, biblical historical context that we were just talking about, like, what are the dangers to Christians and the church if we neglect either one of those diligence in reading or uh, rightly handling God's word? Well, as we know, God reveals himself in his word. So if yeah. we are Christians and want to have fellowship with Christ, which is actually the point of salvation being reconciled to the one that made us and loves us, it's more than just uh, you don't have to burn anymore, but the whole purpose was to be reconciled and have yeah. a relationship with him and fellowship with him. And how are you supposed to have a relationship with somebody that you don't know? Right. So, right. and know intimately. We talk about it all the time about how, you know, in a marriage, you, it'd be weird if we, even if we, our prayer life was great, but we didn't read at all, it'd be like, talking to our wife all the time, telling her all these things, asking her for favors and opinions and encouragement and all this other stuff. Um, help me, help me, help me. Yeah. But I have no, like, I'm not even listening to what you're saying right yeah. now. Right. Yeah. What doesn't work very good. No, was, it doesn't. What was that one quote? It's not, I think it's in chapter one or two of, um, living by the book that we just started. It, it was the quote, um, if you're not in the word, then you're in sin or, or you're living in sin. Well, can you get, do you guys remember that? I know what you're talking about. Well, I don't remember the specific verbiage. Gosh. It sounds right. It was, a we're, we're just going to say that you said it. Yeah. Good. Like our good friend Avery always says, <laughs> yeah. if you're not in the word, you're in sin. Dash Avery. Something Nickham. You're like going that. straight to hell. But it was just saying, if Avery you Nickham. are constantly <laughs> not in the word, then you're going to, sin is going to eat you up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And you, you see evidence of that in the lives of believers and in churches in general, where they have wrongly handled God's word or neglected God's word and either sin or false doctrine is just eating them up. And then question, why is my life so horrible? Why are all these things happening to me? Yeah. Why am I so miserable all the time? Why can't I find joy in anything? Yeah. And I, crazy. I think a danger that comes out of the um, not studying the scriptures like we were just talking about. Like, it should be, as scripture says, that the scripture should be like honey to your lips. Mm -hmm. and it should taste sweet, yeah. that you should cherish it, that it's more, it's more precious than gold. So you should be studying it constantly. You should be diving into it like it's something amazing, like it is. And so you want to... Look at the Hebrew or the Greek context. You want to know what's happening because this is the inspired word of God. But I think a lot of people get their doctrines, like weird doctrines, just from they take it as the, like this, uh, like ESV, or they'll be like, okay, ESV is translated and it's the inspired word of God. So whatever that verse says is what we should do, which I mean is correct. But they kind of stop there, I think, and they don't really look into the context or the background. Yeah. Of it and therefore miss out. Yeah. Yeah. If you miss the historical context, uh, you can apply some really terrible scriptures. Uh, take an Old Testament narrative where God tells them to go into the next village and wipe out everyone, uh, which is God's judgment rightfully upon sinful people. Mm -hmm. It's God giving his people the land. There was a whole bunch of things going on. Yeah. We're like, all right, we're going to Goshen. 
That's it. <laughs> but then they goodbye, Goshen. Yeah, they stopped yeah. there. Okay. And <laughs> because, because I'm rallying they, behind you. <laughs> because they stopped there, um, and they don't really study into it. They don't teach about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where verse by verse forces you to study into yeah. it as you teach to it. Yeah. All right. So here's just just an interesting story for you guys to enjoy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> on. And here's one of the dangers when we start talking about rightly handling God's word and, and thinking through it, we can get really kind of high and mighty and sort of condescending towards everybody else. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You have topical preaching. Hmm. All right. Uh, or you sing those songs, you know, I mean, we're careful about what we sing, but we don't want to be snooty towards other faithful believers who deeply love Jesus yeah. and have different convictions. Right. So every once in a while, this is a good school of ministry story here for guys interested in serving the Lord. God will keep you humble. Like he will not uh, let you rise <laughs> to the place of, of mm-hmm. pride when it comes to his word. So I had an interesting thing. Uh, one of the things that I do, I'll, I'll work throughout the week in preparing sermon notes. And then on Sunday morning, I, I'll read through it and then throw it uh, out the window throw it out the window and say, I'm just going to be led by the spirit. <laughs> no. Uh, so on Saturday, I usually read it through a couple times. Just, you know, I've been doing it through the week, but then it's good to have a, like a little bit of a break where you're not just obsessing over it. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise you, you get real pigeonholed on small things. So give it a day, give it a rest, read through it. But then when I get up in the morning on Sunday and I usually get up stupid early, uh, I've sent it because technology is awesome on PDF to my phone and then I do the thing where the phone reads it to you and so I'll listen to the sermon rather than me reading it Mm because it when you're reading it you're kind of looking in the same space and thinking the same thing hearing it you're sort of hearing with different ears as it were yeah and I'll listen to it three or four times on a Sunday morning before everybody else gets here Mm -hmm. just get it in your head get it in your heart and I noticed we're talking about Noah's three sons Shem Ham and Japheth that in the middle of my notes, instead of putting Japheth, I put Jephthah, who's <laughs> one of the judges in the Old Testament, right? That's and no so way. it's reading it back to me, and it's in the middle, and it, it said Jephthah. And I'm like, oh, no, I typed the wrong thing. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, you know what? This is easy. When I get there, because I knew where it was in my notes, when I get there, what I'm going to do is be intentional about not reading the notes. Just say Japheth. You forgot. Oh, it's worse. It's worse than that. It's much, much worse. Here's what my my poor human finite brain did. It switched every time Japheth was in there. Aww. Go back and listen to the sermon. I said Jephthah like 40 times. <laughs> the wrong dude. I'm just like saying again and again and again, which is sometimes uh, God's reminder to us to be humble. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, talking about us pigeonholing on the, on the minutia of the text. It's a good reminder to keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. So in every text, we're looking uh, how is Christ uh, either shown, foreshadowed or glorified in this? Uh, how is the gospel made known because of this? How are we um, as Francis Schaeffer? How ought we then to live? If this is the revelation of God, like keep the main thing, the main thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you do that, and then you find that you've said the wrong name 40, 50 times in a sermon, (laughs) you can just kind of laugh at it and not freak out. I'm sure no one noticed. I definitely didn't. didn't. Well, I just told everybody. Like there's seven people who know. Now we're going to go back and listen to it. You're going to be like, oh Oh, my goodness, he actually did it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So one of the things I did get right in it, in talking about it, was uh, talking about where it says nations, that the actual word that's used there is for peoples. So it's in the Hebrew text, so it's it's for peoples. But uh, more specifically, that word refers to people groups, mm-hmm. or what we today would call ethnic groups. So uh, if you're hanging around people in the missional community a lot, you'll hear people groups as they're trying to get a better handle on, okay, who is the target of this mission? What, what does it look like for us to uh, take the gospel into a specific ethnic people group that are different in the way they think, in their, their worldview, in their approach to life, uh, in their approach to uh, 
how they worship God in their approach to one another, like all these differences. And if we, if we miss that, we're going to, we're being, we become the bull in the China shop who just goes crashing in and goes, be like us, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is terrible. Which, that's not the way Super God made dangerous. us. Yeah. Yeah. Not great at all. Yeah. Uh, so having said that, what do you think most people hear when they hear the word nations? What, what are they thinking? And why do you think we think that? Us. USA. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I like that you went to that first. Like, not just U.S., Canada, China, <laughs> Russia, Mexico, like us. There's, there's a primacy that we tend to see because of our own American arrogance. Mm-hmm. White Jesus. White Jesus. White Jesus. Yeah. Us above everyone else. Us, then everyone else. Yeah. What are you going to say, Avery? Um, I don't know. Most people probably look at that word nations as like, uh, I don't know. Africa or Asia is like one big people group. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. That's not in the United States. Yeah. Missions kind of stuff. So So we, we see ourselves as number one and then we group other vast areas of the world and like everybody there is the same. Everybody there is the same. (laughs) There's a, uh, a movie that came out way ahead of its time. For those of you who hate movies, I just apologize. Uh, (laughs) But the cable guy, have you guys seen that? Sounds you familiar. haven't seen the, you guys we're concluding the podcast because cable two members guy. have just been kicked off. <laughs> we're going to be right back. And we're going to yeah. watch the cable guy. Yeah, We got to watch cable guy. And then we'll be back. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's this, this scene where it's, uh, it's this court case that's on, on TV and the guy's lying about who did it. And he's trying to pin it on somebody else. And he's like, I think they were Asian. <laughs> Because they were speaking Asian, <laughs> but you just take, take like a whole continent mm-hmm. and then we lump them together. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe because of American pride mm-hmm. and arrogance and condescension towards the rest of the world, they're like, oh, those people groups don't matter. Let's just lump them all in the same group. Mm-hmm. And then we can't understand, like we talked a couple of weeks ago, uh, like what's the d- deal going on with Russia and Ukraine? Well, it's two different people groups it's different ethnic groups they're coming at it from different vantage points and distinctions and then you find that all over like why does iran and iraq keep fighting they're different ethnic groups Um, why do the kurds fight with you know other people and it we find it again and again I, i actually think we see it in some part in america like we talk about people from the south like southern people Mm -hmm. northern people west coasters east coasters Texans, Texans, uh, uh, category. All yeah, they're, all, they're, all, yeah. they're all on their own. Big, big shout out to uh, Andrew and Brittany who you're not full on Texans yet, <laughs> but you'll be, you'll be part of the big Texas here pretty soon. Sorry. But, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right. So what, how does it affect us if we don't think rightly about ethnic groups and people groups? Like what, what are the giant mistakes we can make? Uh, what are some of the dangers there? What are some of the positives if we do think about it rightly? I think it could be demolishing for missions. Like you How said, so? like a like a bowl in a china shop. Yeah. Cuz you have to be trained cross culturally like to, to every tribe does. They train sure. you yeah. um, how to take that into other places. And yeah. Because it can be so detrimental if you take the gospel into another people group and then not I don't know. You should try to adapt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Be aware of your surroundings. Like Paul does at one point. I forget, Where did he go? Where he kind of adapts to that environment. Um, I forget. But well, he's going to say a couple of times, I attempt to be all things to all people that by some measure, by, by some means, I might win everybody. And yeah, it, Paul is the great gospel chameleon in the right sense of the word. Never, mm-hmm. never compromising on the content of the gospel, but the packaging of it, man, uh, he just opened up doors to take it to the Gentiles where everybody else was thinking we got to make the Gentiles look like Jews. Yeah. And Paul, he's really the spearhead of everything we see in missions today. Yeah. And it's kind of cool to, uh, cause United States, sometimes we can get so like, I don't know, we want to know our, theology which is great right yeah. we we do want to know it. we have the abilities and the resources to do that stuff 
But then when Jody and I went to cross conference, we got to hear a missionary's testimony. He was there for like 13 years in Papua New Guinea to an unreached tribe. He learned Hebrew and Greek just so he could translate the text into a new language that no one else learned, right? Wow. He did it. And then instead of trying to teach them the way Americans would be taught, which we could, Americans are pretty well illiterate, right? So they could just teach us like this right now. Yeah. But in another country, especially not knowing their language, it could be a lot harder. And so what they did was actually, instead of just trying to teach them verbally, they actually did skits mm -hmm. of different stories of the Bible. And then every time they'd get to a certain point, the people would know that um, uh, Jesus was coming, but they didn't know which skit yet. And so every time they'd do a different skit, the people would be like, is this the one that's coming? Yeah. And then awesome. they'd be like, no, no, just wait, just wait. And then when they finally got to the skit of Jesus dying on the cross, or they, they were like ecstatic. They were like, this is the one, surely. Yeah. And they did. And then when they liked the story or when something good was happening, they would yell either, my belly's full in their language. Or if they didn't like something, they'd be like, I'm not hungry or something like that. That's interesting. And that's like a different cross-cultural thing. And yeah. if we went there and tried to teach it our way, just be destructive and yeah. no progress. Yeah. Speaking on that, um, while we're talking about Genesis 10, um, could you imagine us doing a skit on, on Genesis 10? Genealogy <laughs> skit. <laughs> Can we do that? We just got to get the Yoder boys up there. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. So many of them. <laughs> yeah. So why does, why does it matter for us to know that? Like Papua New Guinea, yep, we get it. Uh, Destin and Jen up in Northern Ontario with the native people up there. Yep. We get it. Like we live in tiny little Indiana community. Like what does it matter for us to rightly think about people groups? It's important to remember that the gospel was not meant for one people group. Well, good. I guess you could say it was God's people. You know, but God's people is filled with diverse people from all different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages, and um, whole different things that make up who they are. Yeah. And I think it's Charles Spurgeon who tried or did so much in learning a bajillion different things just so that he would always have a way to connect somebody to the gospel have mm -hmm. some type of transition conversation that would lead to the main point yeah and i think if we don't give this the right attention um that's necessary then we limit ourselves to that joy that comes in sharing the gospel with somebody uh, we limit ourselves to our white 25 year old neighbor with yeah. a white wife and kids yeah you know so gospel is meant for every ears to be heard so we have to be diligent in making an effort to make those connections so that we can have those conversations good yeah i've got two things if i may Sorry jump I'm in talking so much no it's good i'm just like passionate about the cross-cultural thing so you said in like northeast indiana why would that be important because like you said, there are people groups. There are so many different people groups. Not every people group is the same, right? And like, for instance, we have the English and then the Amish. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's like the correct <laughs> grammar for that. Here it is. Here it is. It is, it is yeah. here, yeah. But I was struggling for the longest time at work to proclaim the gospel to certain Amish people because there are a lot of Amish people who are genuine Christians, right? Sure. Yeah. And I was struggling hard. And then one day, Pete Kaufman, my boss, who was Amish, and he knows the Amish really well, he said, Avery, I think your problem is is some most Amish want to know that you are a sinner too, that you messed up before, that you mess up still. Mm -hmm. Because if you keep trying to teach them that way, that, like the way you are, they're going to think you are perfect and that you're just judging them. And it yeah. was so true. Yeah. And so now I try to 
constantly remind him that I am a sinner and I mess up and I'm not a good person, Mm -hmm. but because of God, I'm saved. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's why it's also important here. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. The beginning of the conversation has to be, uh, we identify we're the same. Like we're, we're different. We we have different cultures, uh, different upbringings, different experiences, but we're the same. Like when we stand before God, we, yeah, made in his image, Mm -hmm. uh, sinners, uh, who on their own are incapable of saving themselves in need of a savior. And into that, well, now our center becomes Christ and not our shared experience because our, our experiences can look really, really different. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think individual Christians, and I know one of the things I've struggled with in the past is thinking everybody is just like me. Everybody's going to think like me. Uh, this is how they're going to process information, whether it's the Bible or church or personal relationships. And then when they don't, I'm like blown out of the water. Like what on earth? Mm -hmm. How could they, how could they say this or think this or do this and realizing, okay, we all have these different worldviews, these different approaches Mm -hmm. that sets the stage for now. I'm looking for ways of identification that we can put Christ back in the center rather than, well, we're, we're basically joined together because we all think alike. Mm-hmm. or we act alike or uh we do this alike or that alike that's a social club yeah yeah you know and you you trace that down far enough that's a cult but christ the center is evangelical that it's gospel yeah. centered that's what that word means right good all right so last one here that i want us to talk about is is thinking with that christ at the center whether it's old testament or new testament whether it's a historical narrative drawn out of the Old Testament or uh, gospel epistles written in the New Testament that are uh, filling in the story of what the gospel authors had told us of Christ's life. And now guys like Paul are going, and man, this is how it works in your life. This is how it works in the church. In all of that, we want to see Jesus at the center of it, right? And so you pull back and look at the the big picture, the, the meta narrative of all of scripture And you find what we mentioned earlier, God choosing a family out of all the families of the earth. So God is the one who creates all these families of the earth, Mm -hmm. all these different ethnic groups, people groups, which is why one's not better than another. And then he makes like this prototype of one family, shrink it down up to one guy, Abraham, and says, all right, from you, I'm going to create this great nation. Choosing a family out of all the families of the earth, but the the plan, fast forward to Christ, is so that all these families of the earth get this invitation to be part of God's family. Beautiful. It, it when you when you see that giant overarching view, you're like, oh God, you're a genius. Yeah, it's like that people <laughs> group where it's like, is this the one? Is this the one? Yeah. And it's like, oh, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. And then when Jesus dies, it's like my belly is full. Wow, yeah. that story was good. Yeah. yeah, this is what it's all been aiming yeah. at, right? It's amazing because in that in that specific context that you're talking about, when it says that through Abraham and his offspring, all the nations would be blessed, and it's it is through Abraham, but it's actually because of Christ and through Christ from that family yeah. that all the nations are blessed. Yeah, and that's I think that's really awesome. Yep. So how should that motivate us? Like what, what should that do in our hearts to drive us either as individual Christians or as a church or looking missionally at people groups in the, in the earth, how should that understanding motivate us? So it should motivate you by, it's like the opposite side of this. So you said that one it started with one family who yeah. goes to Jesus, which is then is an invitation to all people groups, the nations, right? Mm-hmm. To enter the kingdom of heaven, an invitation. Now, if you go to the flip side, if they don't get the invitation or they are, their eyes are not opened, then what happens? They die and burn in hell. Yeah. Right? They are in, an, in hell for an eternity. That yeah. should be the motivation for that. I yeah, I don't I, remember who it was that somebody uh, talking in into the missions context, and he said, "Good news that gets there too late is not good news." Yeah, yeah. Think of the illustration yeah. of somebody's facing away um, on a tr- on a, a set of train tracks, 
and they don't know that a that a train is coming and it's about to hit them and they get squished and then you're like hey there's a train co-. right oh. yep you know yeah so and but even above that that shouldn't be your only motivation your only your only motivation should be because god's grace you were able to enter the kingdom of heaven which you should love him so much that you would also want yeah. to yeah 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 it's not just about, and I, I think John Piper does a great job of filling this out, uh, and I think it's in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, but the point is not our salvation. Mm. Right? That, that makes the gospel all about us. Mm. That Jesus loved Avery, Jesus loved Josiah so much, blah, 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 whole big story that he could lead you, and now here you are, ta-da, right? Like that's the center, but rather that out of every nation, every people group, every tribe, So shrink it down to uh, areas, every clan, every family, every tongue, every language that's out there, that within them, God is raising up people to worship him. Mm -hmm. He's building a choir of the world that is literally made up of the whole world, of all these people groups. And yes, they have the benefit of being saved, which is super good news for them. But the thing it's actually about is God is raising up an army choir to proclaim his glory and to worship him in every single one of these places. That's a different motivation than like sort of the selfish self-centered version of, well, it's all about you and you know, God loves you. True. God wants you to be saved. True. Like this is good news for you, but that's not actually the good news. The good news is that our God is worthy of praise and will be glorified and proclaimed in every corner of the earth. And then the end shall come. And on top of that, he's going to do it no matter what. Like his name will be glorified um, and his word will be proclaimed whether you do it or not. But man, we want to be a part of that. Yeah. 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 We don't want to miss out on that opportunity, that joy that comes with that. Um, We want to be a part of it. So that's world, right? That's big picture world stuff. Shrink that all the way down to this little world that you have of like your family, husband, wife, children, grandchildren, like how does that, how does that translate into that? And I I guess the question is, can we, what's our responsibility? And then can we actually parent our kids into the kingdom of God? Uh, We can't husband our wives into the kingdom of God. We can't, father our children into the kingdom of God. Um, We can't friendship our friends into the kingdom of God. Uh, It's a really good way of saying it. Yeah, we can't. It's not on us. Trademark, Josiah. Thanks. (laughs) Bring in the money. (laughs) No. um, If we understand that God is the giver of life and the taker of life and the one who gives and grants gifts salvation, um, then it's kind of even more glorious to understand that no, not only can we not do that, but thank goodness we can't because we wouldn't be able, we, yeah, we wouldn't be able, no one would get saved. Yeah. No one would get to be a part of that family that God has made for himself. We would miss, we would all miss out. We would all fall away without God, um, being directly involved into the making and shaping of his own family. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the saying I've heard somebody say of, uh, if we could lose our salvation, we would. We would. Yeah. Absolutely. We would. And we would mess it up for the next generation. And then we would then we would rightly say what a lot of parents say, which is, oh man, is this my fault? Well, yeah, you contributed to this train wreck yeah. that is your child. Uh, we want to be faithful and diligent parents. But Psalm three is still true. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So if our kids are going to be part of the eternal family of God, it's going to be a sovereign work of grace. Yeah. And not just Avery had it all together. Josiah had it all together. Anybody else had it all together, said all the right things, did all the right things. Like it's God who makes dead hearts mm. come alive. Yeah. And that there's a piece with coming with that, knowing that we can't do it because um, the responsibility is not necessarily on us, but that doesn't take away the necessity of it and the desire to do it. Because like I've said, and I keep saying, and I will, I will keep saying, we want to be a part of it. Yeah. If by God's grace that uh, my son will be born into his kingdom and 
grow up to um, accept salvation for himself um, and have his own faith and own personal relationship with Christ. And I had something to do with that, some little part of instilling godly values and teachings and um, up, like into my son. Like I get to be a part of that. I get to reap in the benefit of the joy of watching yep. my son um, do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And I was a part of it. Yeah. So. Super cool. Yeah. Which is, is awesome. Uh, Cause we've had this thing in our secondary bathroom at our house forever. That was like a picture of Miriam and McKay on there. And it was like, be careful who you date, who you give your heart to. Uh, because that guy, especially when you marry him, is going to have more impact on your kid's life of what they believe about Jesus, how they live for him, than any other person on the planet. Mm-hmm. You better choose wisely. And it said much better than that. But yeah, but that? I think I think <clears throat> you should also um, be more specific about the fact of its actual location, <laughs> uh, which will give which will give context to how important it actually is yeah because yeah. you I've wanted us to read so it times. so many times <laughs> um so much in fact that you placed it directly across the toilet yeah yeah like the wall probably, that you look at when you probably sit down quote sentences from it yeah, yeah. <laughs> you probably well, I'm pretty good. sure we all joking. could and, and you didn't even live there and that <laughs> you know was the I idea mean? that yeah. so that that's the perfect example of yeah. we cannot open our kids eyes. We can't make them believe Uh, it's only God. It's only the power of the Holy spirit that can do that. But what we do is every opportunity we have, we put Christ before them. We put Christ before them in the way we live in the conversations we have uh, in the things that we do and the things that we don't do and the correction we bring to them uh, in the things that we say, this is important. You should look at this (laughs) even in the bathroom. Uh, we're constantly putting it in front of them. And then we are crying out to God, God, save them. Mm -hmm. God, open up their eyes that they would see Jesus. Even if it annoys them, will they just keep pushing away? You still have to be an image of God. Now, having said that, if on the other hand, you know, I mean, just take the bathroom illustration here. It's kind of weird place to really, you know, like this is my chance. This is great. This is great. Rather than something like that, that's well positioned, for them to consume, you know, imagine every time somebody went to the bathroom, we're like, Hey, well, you're in there and I have a captive audience. I just want to tell you, you know, we, <laughs> we gave him our little Jesus spiel or something like that. It's not long before friends are like, I'm never going back to that house. Our kids are asking somebody else to move in. Uh, non-Christians are like, I hate every time that dude comes around. Right. I mean, we are, we become an impediment to the gospel and it's all that cultural stuff that we were talking about. Like we got to find those bridges of identification Mm -hmm. and then, man, we build the bridge of relationship so that we can drive the truck of the gospel across it. Yeah. Rather than a lot of people just, they get a hold of the gospel. It's sort of the cage stage Christian and then everything's a bulldozer, you know, (laughs) here I come. Yeah. And you know, man, we got to find ways to, love people, encourage people, and then just put Christ on display yeah. in our words, in our actions, in our life, and the way that we love them and care for them. Um, that, that's part of what we're going to do on Sunday in the baby dedications is uh, say, it's super good, super good that you're going to stand up and do the, uh, <laughs> the Lion King thing, you know, where they hold up the baby. What do they say there? What's the, uh, anybody know that? I think it's just a song. I don't know. <laughs> you want to oh, give it a shot? No, yeah. I don't know what they say right there, but yeah. uh, it feels like occasionally that's how we look at baby dedications. Like it's this, this moment in a movie. No, it, it's a snapshot. It's a Polaroid of an entire life. And if the whole rest of the life doesn't match it, it doesn't matter what you said in there. Like, God, we're going to dedicate this child to you. Uh, help us be diligent moms, dads, grandmas, and grandpas, whatever it is to pour God's word into them, to pray for them, for God, to save them, to open up their eyes. And then if we just lived like the rest of the world, the rest of their lives, we should not be surprised that that kid wants nothing to do with Jesus. Mm -hmm. It it has to be that, that total life package. When you look at these uh, table of nations and 
how most of them within a hundred years have so forsaken the God who saved Noah and their ancestors that they're going to build. We're going to look at this week after next build the tower of Babel with the idea of we are really going to lock into our own version of God Mm -hmm. and God strikes them and splits them Mm -hmm. like it divides their nations and divides their languages. It doesn't take long for our families that started off faithful to drift away to where our grandchildren, great grandchildren don't know anything about Jesus. They did not know. Yeah. What was that scripture in the beginning of Exodus? The, there was a time when the Israelites did not know, or I forget. Never mind. Ignore it. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Direct quote. Well, even even scarier is when you get to Judges, and it's basically there's no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. That's our world right now. Yeah. Like just do what's right in your own eyes. And we wrong. have to be people. I mean, look at the look at the trajectory of our conversation here. People who are their lives are governed and intentional about building it around God's word, rightly understanding God's word, that we can rightly understand the people around us and share Jesus with them. We can rightly understand the people close to us and share Jesus with them. Start to finish. It's all God. It's all his work. It's all his word. And we just want to be faithful in the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, guys, thanks for sitting in. It feels like you both did fantastic. That's good. To hear. I did better than I thought I would. So. I thought you were going to say I did better than Josiah. <laughs> well, oh, man, coming in cocky. What a guy. All right. Well, seriously, thanks to both of you for uh, sitting in, being part of this conversation. And thanks to everybody who listened. Uh, make sure that you like and subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you're getting all the future episodes. And Lord willing, we will see you this coming Lord's Day. Uh, worship is at 10 a.m. Adult Sunday School starts at 9. And uh, we'll look forward to fellowship then. All right, John, this is for you. Yeah, everybody's waving at John. Bye, John. (laughs) (laughs) All right, thanks for joining in.